This evening, we are going to start out with a prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And I am so thankful that I have a God that teaches me how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. Good evening to all of you. We're glad you're here tonight. I would like to have prayer with you before I begin. So can you bow your heads with me? Loving Father, as we spend time together, we ask that you'll give me clarity of thought and that those that hear may understand. For Jesus' sake we pray it. Amen. There were two uh, travelers traveling together. Uh, actually, there were attorneys, young attorneys, and they were traveling uh, the, the old steam engine across the Rocky Mountains. One of them was Robert Ingersoll, the great skeptic. How many of you have heard of Robert Ingersoll? And the other one was Lou, Will Lou Wallace. How many of you have heard of Lou Wallace? Uh, they got into a discussion over the Bible. And Ingersoll, who was a skeptic and didn't believe in the Bible, uh, began to kind of needle Lou Wallace with questions. Uh, well, Lou, let's talk. Talk about what? Let's talk about the great things about life. Like what? Well, what about the Bible? This is it true. What about God? Is there a God? And he kept on saying, and what about Jesus? Is he really who he said he is? And he kept on saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Well, the problem was that even though they got into this deep discussion, both discovered that neither knew enough about the subjects themselves. Lou Wallace, being the Christian, was embarrassed that he could not give the appropriate answers. Later on, he became governor of uh, New Mexico. And there used to be a pastor right there in that city called Santa Fe. Any of you have been to Santa Fe, New Mexico? So you know what I'm talking about, the governor's palace right downtown. Right there in that governor's palace, Lou Wallace wrote a response to his friend. And he wrote it in a book entitled, guess what, Ben-Hur. 
How many of you have read the book? How many of you saw the film? How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? How many of you don't want to raise your hand? Lou Wallace became the governor of uh, New Mexico. And he wrote the book because that discussion kept nagging him for years. And he felt that he needed to write what his understanding was about Christ. And that's why the book called Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. Now, obviously, today there are a lot of people who still have questions. And it's amazing how it is that after these many years that the Bible has been around, there's still people who have never really have opened the book. They don't know what's in it. Uh, and they think like I used to think, that people who read the Bible uh, in a religious are just not too smart. Unfortunately, that's the way I used to think. But later on, when I uh, had an experience with the Lord, I realized that there was a lot in the Bible that I had no idea was there. And so I began to study it. And that's why today I'm a proponent of that wonderful treasure called the Bible. It has been such a blessing to me. The scripture says that we have not followed a what? A commonly devised, what's the next word? fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty we have also a what more sure word of what a prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed you, do you notice what it's saying we have a sure word of prophecy and you need to take heed it says as unto a what a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter is the one that's writing this as an eyewitness to what he saw. But not only to what he saw, to what he experienced. And uh, later on, after his denial of Christ, he became one of the great stalwarts of the gospel the Bible, and in particular, Jesus Christ. Knowing this first, he wrote, that no what? No prophecy of the scriptures is of what? Any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Peter witnessed, he saw, he experienced, and then he writes his experience in what we consider today a part of the Holy Bible. But he writes about prophecy. And the reason why he writes about prophecy is because prophecy has a prominent place in the Scriptures more than most people know and understand. Prophecy is only a prediction of what? Of the future. Made under divine inspiration. And the word inspiration is an interesting word because it, it means God breathed. What does it mean? God breathed. Which means then that God had a part to play in the writing of the scriptures, that he breathed, as it were, into Peter that which he needed to write. And, but most of what was written in the scriptures was prophecy. Did you know that? Let me just uh, show you a few verses of scripture. Jesus said to his disciples prior to his going to the cross, Now I tell you before it, what? It come. What do you call that? If you predict what happens before it comes. Prophecy. Now I tell you before it comes that when it is come to pass, you may what? You may believe that I am he. 
So the role of prophecy in the scriptures is to enable the reader or the, he that hears to have faith in God. So as you study prophecy, it should lead you to a stronger belief in God. And we're hoping that as you are listening and as you study the word, that when you finish these seminars, you will have a stronger belief and faith in God. And if there were ever a time when people need to have a stronger faith in God, it is when? Yeah. It is now. There are too many uncertain things taking place. Is that true? Too many things happening. And so we need to have something that we can trust in. And I believe that is the scriptures. In J. Barton's Paine's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, he lists 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New. A total of how much? 1,817 prophecies. That's a lot of prophecies. Would you agree with me? A lot of prophecies. How many of you knew that there were that many prophecies in the Bible? <laughs> One hand. Well, bless your heart. Two. 1,817 Bible prophecies. Which means then that the Bible is a prophetic book. Now, in the scriptures, if you have your Bibles in your hands... They are, they are, it's actually broken down into several sections. And I should explain to you why it is uh, organized that way. The Hebrews, which today we call the Jews, when they put the Old Testament together, what they did was they, would, they divided them up into uh, sections. Uh, for example, the first group is historical. They considered the historical books as the first. Then the, there was the Psalms or songs. And so the book of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, those books were supposed to be books of songs. And the reason why you have, for example, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah back in the, toward the beginning of the Bible, before Daniel, is because Daniel was considered to be a prophetic book, even though it's filled with history. And Ezra and Nehemiah were considered to be historical books. But Ezra and Nehemiah actually happened after Daniel. It took place during the Medo-Persia period of time, which came after Babylon. And Daniel was in the Babylonian period of time. But in the Bible, you find then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther as the historical books, which actually took place after Daniel. Do you understand that? Okay. So they were not concerned about putting the Bible together alphabetically speaking or chronologically speaking. They put them together in reference to what they thought, which category these particular books fit in. And so that's why you have Genesis and, and you have Leviticus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then you have the Judges and Joshua, etc. And Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther. And then you have the Chronicles, the Kings, the Chronicles, and Samuels. All of those are considered to be historical books. But within all those books, there is found prophecy. But the books that were considered to be prophetic books were separated and placed after Psalms or the Songs. And so then you have the major prophets, which is like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. And then you have the minor prophets, which are those little books that uh, people have difficulty finding. And even trying to remember what they, uh, the names are actually. Uh, and so when you say, let's turn to the book of uh, Habakkuk. People are saying, Habakkuk, what's that? Or when you say, let's turn to the book of Amos. They think of Amos and Andy. <laughs> so there are a lot of people who really don't know the little minor prophet books, but they are nonetheless called prophetic books. And that's why you finally end up with the prophetic books from, from Isaiah to Malachi. 
you have that. Is that clear? But within all those books, even though the major and minor prophets are basically full of prophecy, the historical books also have prophecy in them. Okay? In fact, the first prophecy in the Bible is actually found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. That is the first prophetic uh, verse of Scripture in the, in the Bible. And the last prophetic text in the Bible, of course, is found in the book of Revelation. And it simply says, even so come Lord Jesus. So even though it was a prayer, it was prophetic in nature. Because it's speaking about the coming of Christ. So you have the Bible begin with prophecy, and the Bible ends with prophecy. And the role of prophecy is to help us to believe. Now, there are many, many uh, what is considered to be sacred books. For example, it's Confucius. And I uh, have done some research to find out about when these books were written. Uh, by the way, BCE simply means before the common era. People who are not necessarily religious uh, would rather say before the common era, E-R-A, as opposed to before Christ. Okay? Most Christians would say B.C., which is before Christ, or A.D., the year of the Lord. Uh, but the, uh, those who prefer not to be religious basically say before the common era. So, Confucius wrote uh, before the common era, which means before Christ. Buddha wrote before Christ. And the Hindu writings uh, actually were written before Christ, or should I say, they began to be written. And many of these uh, writings that were not just uh, done in, in a day or a year. Many times they were done in a period of several, several years, as you can see there. The Quran uh, was written about 609, common era, which we, we normally say A.D., okay? Which means then that 600 years after Christ is when the Quran was written. Then the uh, uh, youngest set of writings are the Japanese uh, sacred writings. And uh, they were written around the year 702 to 712. So what's interesting about all this is this. That considering all of the sacred writings which... Uh, have created what we call different uh, ideologies out there, like Buddhism, Hinduism, etc. All of these writings actually came after the Bible. Not before. Which is interesting because Moses wrote about 1,400 years before Christ. Which means then that Confucius, who wrote uh, about 600 uh, or 500 B.C., actually took some of his ideas from where? From the Bible. The Quran took some of the ideas from the Bible. All of these writings took some of the ideas from where? From the Bible. So the Bible is the oldest sacred writings, and it happens to be the cornerstone of Christianity. However, all of these other particular ideologies have something in common in that they borrowed from the scriptures. The Quran, by the way, mentions more about Jesus than actually mentions about Muhammad. I don't know if you knew that or not. And all true Muslims believe in Jesus, not as God, but as a prophet, because their Quran writes about Jesus, okay? So it's interesting then that the Bible then is the foundation of faith. Of what? Faith. Of faith. However, just like today, there are 44,000 different Christian denominations. Did you hear what I said? How many? 44,000 different Christian denominations from one Bible. You can understand why there are so many different ideologies out there. But there's still only one Bible. What's interesting about the Bible 
uh, is that the Bible distinguishes itself from all the other writings by mentioning that it is prophetic in nature. Look at this verse of Scripture. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are God's. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. In other words, here's a text that God is writing concerning things that are called gods. And he is challenging these so-called gods by saying, if you're if really a god, then predict what's going to happen in the future. So he says then, do something to demonstrate that in reality... You are what you claim to be. Which means then that God claims to be superior in that he can foretell the future. Here's another one. Remember what? The former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring what? The end from what? Beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. He is the only one who declares himself to be able to foretell accurately what's going to happen in the future. And he does in his word challenge all the other writings, because what's interesting is that the other writings do not have prophecy. The Bible is the only one that is saturated with prophecy, setting itself aside as superior to all the other writings that are out there. Aren't you glad that you believe in the Bible? Isn't it nice to discover that you are believing in something that started out everything else? <laughs> well, we can't take credit for it, but we can at least enjoy the reality that the Bible is foundation. What do you say? And by the way, uh, don't be afraid to say amen. It won't spook me. <laughs> what or who is the central theme of the Bible? The entire Bible focuses on who? There are a lot of people who believe that the Old Testament focused on the Father and the New Testament focused on the Son. But the Bible does not support that idea. The Bible supports the idea that the entire Bible is about Christ. It's about what? Christ. And that may be surprising. Let me just show you a few verses of Scripture. First of all, in the book of Revelation, which we'll be studying. So tonight this is kind of a launching off into the Bible. But I wanted to first make sure that we were on the same page and that we actually are are studying from the same book. Do you understand? So, the Bible then, it's declared to be focusing on Christ. And when Christ was glorified in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, Christ made a statement to John. He said, I am what? Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus himself claims to be the beginning and the end. And in another passage, when he was just resurrected, and he was walking with the men to Emmaus. Do you remember? Those men who were just uh, terribly shaken by what had happened that weekend. As they are walking to their home, Jesus joins them. And begins to ask them questions. And they basically said, well, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know the things that have happened this weekend? Uh, how that Jesus, a man that was great in, in uh, healing, etc. How he was crucified, etc. And so Jesus, then Jesus says to them, O oh, fools. By the way, that word does not have the same connotation that we have today. It just simply means, oh, you who do, who do not believe. What does it mean? Oh, you who do not believe. Okay. 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now notice he's speaking about all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, if you believe what the prophets have written, you should have known that Christ would have suffered these things and would have entered into his glory. So the reason why you're confounded is because you haven't believed. Is it possible that you and I can read the word and still not believe? Is that possible? I've known people who have read the Bible from cover to cover and still do not believe. It is possible for people to teach the Bible and they themselves not believe. It was a theologian in the Methodist University Theological Seminary who made the statement many years ago in the 60s that God is dead. How many of you remember that? Some of you do remember that. So, it is possible for you to teach it, it is possible for you to read it, but it's also possible that you may not believe it. And the purpose of prophecy is to help you to get over that and be able to believe. Good news? Now, beginning at what? When did he start? Why does it say Moses? Moses is the word or the name used by Hebrews or Jews dealing with the first five books of the Bible. So when they say Moses, they're speaking about the first five books of the Bible. So where did Jesus begin to prove to these men that what happened to him was supposed to happen to him? Notice he didn't begin in Revelation. Where did he begin? In the first books of the Bible. In Moses. Okay. So beginning in Moses. Which means then that if you and I are going to understand Revelation, we must understand the reality that you cannot understand Revelation if you do not begin where you're supposed to begin. Where? In the Old Testament. Is that strange? So, the Old Testament then was what Jesus used to prove to the disciples that he was who he claimed to be. That everything that happened to him was not happenstance. It was not just some incident, an accident that took place. Everything that happened to him had been predicted in the Old Testament, beginning in the writings of Moses. But he continues, it says, and he expounded unto them in how much of the scriptures? All of the scriptures. Which means then that if you're going to study the Bible and you're going to study prophecy, you must realize that you cannot stay in one little book. That you're going to have to compare text with text, verse with verse, to come to the right conclusion. If you don't do that, then you are subject to your own interpretation. But if you compare verse with verse, then you will let the Bible interpret itself. So what I'm going to be doing with you from night to night is sharing with you the verses that compare one with the other so that you can see that there's consistency in the scriptures and that you can begin at the beginning and finally end at the new beginning. Because the Bible does not finish with an end. The Bible finishes with a new beginning. Do you understand? So the, the, the Lord then, Anxious to help his believers understand how to consider the scriptures, gave an example as to how to study it. Beginning where? With Moses and all the prophets. And by the way, when Jesus was speaking, there was no New Testament. The only thing that was present was the Old Testament. Now, he said to them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are what? They are they that what? Testify of me. Now, please understand, Jesus is not trying to steal glory from the Father. Because Jesus came to glorify the Father. But in order for us to understand the Father, we must first understand the Son. That's why the Bible focuses on the Son. 
Because the Son is the one that has been seen. The Father, no one has ever seen. So if you want to understand something about the Father, you must understand that the Bible is first primarily revealing the Son. Jesus then is the center of the entire Bible. He didn't say here, search your scriptures, for they are they which testify of my Father. He said, search your scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. And the word testify is an interesting word. It means then that the people who wrote the Bible were actually writing, testifying about somebody. So who are they testifying about? About Jesus. Jesus then is the center of the entire Bible. So in John 5, he says, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For what? For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So, if you don't believe in the Old Testament, then you do not have a foundation from which to build on, and you come to the wrong conclusions. It is possible then for people to believe in a Jesus, but not the Jesus. Can I say that again? It is possible for a person then to believe in a Jesus and not the Jesus. Because the Bible only reveals one Jesus. How many? One Jesus. The Bible does not reveal many Jesuses. Only one. But in order for you to believe in him, you must know about him. And you must understand something about his nature, his character, how he works, what he does, what he doesn't do. And the example that he gave when he came to live on earth so that you can follow the correct Jesus. Otherwise, without the scriptures, you can follow a Jesus. And this is why people are subject to being deceived by people who claim to be Jesus. For many centuries, the ancient manuscripts that were available of the Bible were about 900 A.D. In other words, manuscripts that were written about 900 A.D. In it. And because those are the only manuscripts that were available, people then suppose that the Bible had been changed, altered, fixed, manipulated, and therefore that you cannot really have confidence in the Scriptures. I remember when I was a young boy, I grew up in New York City, and I remember as a young lad uh, being skeptical about people who were religious. And I remember the arguments that we used to use uh, against people who believed. And I'm embarrassed now of what I believed before because I was wrong. But in those days, I thought I was right. And you could argue in those days that you don't know for sure if what you have is the original text because the manuscripts that were available were not very old. I mean, 900 A.D., which means then that almost a thousand years after Christ. So people question whether or not, yeah, that this really reflected the original. So what's interesting is this, that in 1947, a little boy threw a stone in a cave, if you remember the story, and shattered some pottery, and he climbed up and discovered these ancient scrolls. And so, uh, when the experts went in, they discovered that these were actually manuscripts of the Bible. And they began to uh, take them out and study them. And what's amazing is this. Uh, Josh uh, McDowell, Evidence Demands the Verdict, page 58, says this. In one chapter of 166 words, there's only one word, three letters, in question after a thousand years of transmission. 
Isn't that amazing? How much change? One word in one chapter, and that was with 166 <laughs> words. And what he says is this, and this word does not significantly change the meaning of the message. Here's a statement by uh, Dr. Uh, Sir uh, Frederick Kenyon. He says, The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hands the what? The true word. Isn't it comforting to know that the book that you hold in your hand is actually the same wording that was written 3,000 years ago? What do you say? Now, it, it, it's amazing because when God decided to write the Bible, he did not lead Moses to write the Bible in the language that Moses was educated in. He wrote the Bible in a language that was little known. And that language is called Hebrew. And the first Hebrew mentioned in the Bible is Abraham. So Abraham spoke Hebrew. So when you read the Bible today, you are reading a translation of what your great, 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 great father Abe knew and understood. And that's comforting. What do you say? All right. Now, this was handed down without the essential laws from generation to generation throughout the centuries. So you have a book in your hand that can be traced thousands of years back to its accuracy. And what's amazing is this, that if God had chosen to write the book in hieroglyphics, in the language that Moses was educated in, no one would know today what the Bible said, except something took place. Let me just share some history with you. Napoleon Bonaparte was trying to conquer the world. Do you remember that? And he took 38,000 soldiers down to Egypt. And with him, he took, he took scholars. He took artists. He took uh, scientists, etc. Uh, and then in 1799, one of his soldiers stumbled onto something called a Rosetta Stone. How many of you have heard of the Rosetta Stone? How many of you have been to England and actually have seen the Rosetta Stone? Uh, it's in the museum. You can go to England in London and there... I've taken pictures of the Rosetta Stone. And what's amazing is this, is that Rosetta Stone, here is here's a copy of it, with a little magnification of uh, the hieroglyphics you see on top, with the birds and all that. See what I'm talking about? Okay. So, and this was uh, ancient Egyptian, and then it, there was Greek. Okay. So, in three languages. And so this soldier then stumbled into it, and Napoleon got, and finally I, I, it got to the museum in London, and that's where it is today. Now, what's amazing about this is this, that for centuries nobody understood the history of Egypt and the secrets, etc., of ancient Egypt because nobody understood hieroglyphics. And when this stone was discovered, still nobody understood what it meant, but it turned out that there were three languages so that if somebody wanted to do business in Egypt and the person wrote hieroglyphics, you can, you can take that stone and figure out what he was talking about in Greek. Okay, do you understand? Or ancient Egyptian. Now, it was not until Jean-Francois Champollion in 1822 who deciphered that Rosetta Stone. So think about God's wisdom. If God had written the book in hieroglyphics, number one, it would not have been as small as you have it now. Because hieroglyphics demanded a lot of space. Okay. Number two, you would not have understood the scriptures until 1822. So for centuries, the Bible would have been locked up in a strange language. Instead, God let the prophets to write in languages, or a language, Hebrew, which was something that was consistent and has not changed in generations. So the Hebrew that's spoken today with a little shift in the accent 
it's the same Hebrew, written Hebrew, that was written back thousands of years ago. So it gives you then comfort in knowing that God kept his hand over his book so that everybody who desired to know about him could so do so, even a child. What do you say? Because Hebrew only has 20, 22 letters in the alphabet. We have 26. Hebrew has 22. Okay? So, uh, the question then that uh, Ingerstahl uh, tried to raise uh, and other people have question is, how can you tell the true Christ? Because presently today, there are several people who claim to be Christ. Uh, they just executed one of them in Japan. There was a man in Japan who was blind, and he claimed to be Christ, and he uh, put gas, poison gas in the trains, and killed people, and injured a lot of people. How many of you remember that? Okay. Well, they just executed him yesterday or the day before. He'd been in prison all this time. Here's a bunch of the people who claim to be Christ. So it's not just one. Can you see that? Right now in the Philippines, there's one. There was one in, uh, who was a Puerto Rican uh, in Miami who claimed to be a Christ. Any of you heard that particular aspect? No? You didn't hear about the Puerto Rican who claimed to be Christ in Miami? Where you all been? As they say down yonder in South. Well, yes, he claimed to be Christ, but fortunately, same fortunately, uh, he passed away. Same fortunately because there are people who believed him and were following him. Okay? So presently, uh, there was one, two Japanese who claim to be Christ. One has been executed. The other one still claims to be Christ. There's one in the Philippines who claims to be Christ. And there's a lot of followers who follow him. So there are people who claim to be Christ. And this is why prophecy plays an important part in identifying the true Christ. Let me just share with you uh, <clears throat> that in the Old Testament, there were 333 prophecies that pointed to Jesus as the Messiah. How many? 333 prophecies. Now remember those numbers because you may find them in your quiz. How many? 333 prophecies. That's a lot of prophecies. And even though there are people who may be negative about the Bible, uh, what kind of community would you have if people merely follow the basic tenets of faith in the Bible. If everybody just kept the Ten Commandments. What kind of city would you have? Would you have a bad city or a good city? I mean, if everybody kept the Ten Commandments, would you have to lock your, your doors? No, nobody would be stealing. Right? All the shops would get rid of their anti uh shoplifting devices. You wouldn't have to have the police department because nobody would be killing, nobody would be stealing. Uh, families would not fall apart. Husbands would not run off with other women or women would not commit adultery against their husbands. I mean, when you think about it, if, if everybody would just follow the basic tenets of the scriptures, uh, this, if this nation did that, what kind of nation would you have? You would have a glorious nation. What do you say? So, I believe then that the Bible serves a purpose, uh, not just to help you to be spiritual, but it has counsel that help you to be a better husband, a better wife, a better son, a better daughter, a, a better citizen, that enables you to become a better person. And so I'm grateful that God has given us this book. Now, I mentioned that Jesus is in the beginning. And here briefly, I'm going to go through a few prophecies to demonstrate that indeed prophecy highlights who the Messiah really is. Okay? The Bible starts with the words, in the what? In the beginning. What book is this one? Which book is that in the Bible? Just testing you. 
Now, if I ask you to find Hezekiah chapter 2, where is that? Where's Hezekiah chapter 2? Is there a Hezekiah? No, there's no Hezekiah. Okay. So, there are uh, things that people think come from the Bible that would come from the Bible. But the Bible starts with what words? In the beginning. In the beginning, who was there? God. God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm going to show you something interesting. In the book of John, it starts up with what words? In the beginning. Are those the same three words? Yes. Is it the same time period? Yes or no? It is. See? Now, now listen to me. See, what the Bible is doing in the, in the New Testament is quoting from the Old Testament. Quoting from where? Now, how do I know that? Look at the language. Look at the language. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. By the way, who was that Word? It is Jesus, okay? So, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, notice the next phrase. All things were made by Him. Who is the Him? It is Jesus. Notice that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Let me show you the two more verses in that chapter. Verse 10 and 11. He was in the world. Who's that speaking about? Jesus. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So according to, the, to this verse, then, these verses that we just read, it is speaking about which beginning? The very beginning. Because that's when the world was made. So it's telling us that Jesus was where? In the beginning. That is why the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Is that a new revelation? Because Jesus was not somebody who was just born as a man person later on. Jesus was actually God in the form of God before. And there's a verse that says, The mystery of godliness That he was manifested in the flesh. Okay. So you may think, well, this is disturbing. I've never heard this before. Well, that's why you came to the prophecy. If you heard it before, then you didn't need to come here, right? So the, the, the truth of the matter is this, that there are a lot of things in the scriptures that we don't know are there because somehow either we have not studied it or have been able to connect in uh, the dots. You understand what I'm saying? So, look, Jesus is making it plain that he was where? In the beginning. And that he made the world. The world was made by him. And if you look at first of uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, you will see then that it says that he is the one that created all things and all things were created by him and for him. Colossians chapter 1, you can write that down, okay? The book of Matthew starts out with who? With Jesus. So the book, of the, the book of Moses starts out with Jesus. The book of Matthew starts out with Jesus. And the book of Revelation ends with Jesus. Do you see that? So it says the grace of what? Of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So we find Jesus in the beginning. We find Jesus in the middle. We find Jesus at the end. That is why he said, I am Alpha and... Omega, the beginning and the end. There you have it. So, when you come to this seminar, you're going to hear about Jesus. About who? Jesus. Now, let me just go through a few prophecies here. Just, I'm going to, I'll try to not do eight because eight is a, is a little much for tonight. But I'm just going to do a few prophecies from the Old Testament and show you where they are found in fulfillment in the New Testament. Are you ready? Okay. Tighten your seatbelt. Here we go. All right. In the book of Micah, which one? Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from when? From of all from when? And who is this speaking about? 
Jesus. The Bible says that he was from everlasting. You see that? But the, the prophet says that he will be born where? In Bethlehem. So the Puerto Rican does not qualify. He's born in the wrong place. You understand? The Japanese does not qualify because he's born in the wrong place. The, the Filipino does not qualify because he's born in the wrong place. You have to be born in Bethlehem to qualify as a Messiah. Can you see what God has done? He has predicted it in such a way that only one person can satisfy that prophecy. And that was the one who had been from everlasting. And that is his son. All right? Here's the fulfillment. Matthew 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born where? In Bethlehem. There you have it. So you have the Old Testament prophecy and you have the New Testament prophet pointing back to the Old Testament prophet that it concurs. Jesus was indeed born where? In Bethlehem. It also says he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened up his mouth. He was brought as a what? As a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his, her shearers. Many of us read or, or hear this being read in our churches, uh, especially on Easter, right? But this is speaking about who? The Messiah who would come as a lamb. New Testament, what did John say? The next day John see of Jesus coming unto him and saith what? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Here's another prophecy. Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, have lifted up his heel against me. Psalms was written about a thousand years before Christ. How long? A thousand years before Christ. And it predicted that somebody would betray the Messiah. Who was that somebody? A friend. Well, we know in the New Testament that it happened. Matthew chapter 26. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, why aren't you come? In other words, I wish you didn't come. All right? Another prophecy in Zechariah. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. The prophet is inspired to write, the amount of money that would be offered for the price of the Messiah. How much? 30 pieces of silver. So, if this prophecy is going to be fulfilled, then Jesus has to be sold for how much? 30 pieces of silver. Did that happen? Absolutely. You go to the New Testament, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me that I will, and I will deliver it unto him? And they covenanted with him for how much? Exactly the amount that had been predicted in the Old Testament. Now, this is amazing. What do you say? This cannot just be written by a mad person. Who can predict precisely the amount of money that would be paid for somebody a thousand years later? Do you understand what I'm saying? Obviously then, this is inspired writings. Divine inspiration. God is is so boxing in the true Christ that none other can, can take its place. And he did it with prophecy. With what? With prophecy. Here's another prophecy. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So what would happen to those 30 pieces of silver? They would be cast in the house of the Lord to the potter. Okay? Is that what happened? We'll go to the New Testament. Matthew 27. Notice what it says. And he cast down the pieces of silver where? What's another word for a temple? The house of the Lord. So it was predicted that it would be cast in the house of the Lord. And what happened? It was cast in the house of the Lord. So you think that Judah was figuring out, okay, I'm, I'm going to make sure that this prophecy is fulfilled? No. Because at this point, Judah was, was distraught when he realized what he had done. And went to the priest and said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, that's your business, not ours. And he took the money and threw it where he was in the temple. And then it says that they took counsel and they bought the potter's field. There you have it. The potter, remember? Cast it to the potter. They bought the potter's field. In other words, this was a field that the old pottery and church and all that used to be thrown at. And they bought it to bury 
poor people in. Okay. Can you see that? Amazing, what do you say? Then it, it even predicts what would happen to his clothing. What would happen to what? Now, that's fine-tuning prophecy, what do you say? Getting down right to the, even the clothing. Notice what it says. They part my garment among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And then the soldiers in the New Testament, they took his clothing. What did they do? They divided it into four parts. Then the coat, when they saw the coat, they decided to do what? They decided to cast lots. Let's not tear it. Let's cast lots for it, who it shall be. We know that the Roman soldiers were strangers to divine influences. They were not believers in God. They were not believers in the Jewish religion. But what's interesting is this. Without realizing it, what they were doing was fulfilling what God had said would take place with the clothing of his son thousands of years later. Amen. What do you say? In other words, you can believe in the Bible. And I'm only showing you a few prophecies. But you remember, there are how many? 333 prophecies. So in conclusion, I would love to keep you here all night long, but I can't. Okay. The words of Christ. What does it say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All right. Prophesied a thousand years before they were being said. The very words of Christ. If you go to the New Testament, what do you find? By the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The very words that the Messiah would enunciate out of his crucifixion had been predicted a thousand years before. And when Jesus was there hanging on the cross for you and for me, the words that were wrenched out of his lips was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you think that somebody was remembering that so he could role play when he was being tortured? I doubt it. This is obvious evidence, folks, that prophecy helps us to galvanize together that which re leads us to the true Christ of the Scriptures. Only that Christ can give you salvation. Only in Him can you find guidance and strength and courage. And so that's why a man wrote the song, What a Friend We Have in Whom? In Jesus. How many of you know that song? It's a lovely song. Listen, in conclusion, let me skip this prophecy. Jesus made a statement. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Who is he to you? The Bible makes it plain that he is the, the sent, the son of God. The only one that you can put your trust in. How many of you are thankful that you are acquainted with the Savior tonight? Can I see your hands? I'm so grateful that we have a living Savior. And that Bible prophecy pinpoints who he is. And that is Jesus. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we're grateful that prophecy plays such an important role in the Bible. And that through prophecy, you reveal what's to come. Many are troubled. They sense that things are not right. Things are heading in the wrong direction. They may wonder why. But we're grateful that in your word, through prophecy, you have brought hope and comfort to us in revealing what's about to happen. And as Jesus said, I tell you before it comes to pass, so when it does come to pass, you might believe. Oh God, strengthen our faith in thy precious word, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.